You're listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where each week I'll interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I'm your host, Adam Sokol, and if this is your first time checking in, thanks so much for joining. If you've been here for a while, thanks for coming back. Today's episode is a big one. I've got Grady Hendrix on the episode, and we are talking all about his fascination with folklore and the horror that can come from folklore. Grady has a new book out called How to Sell a Haunted House, which is phenomenal, and it will creep you out in the best way possible. Grady writes these books where he takes things that we can all relate to, a modern day house, uh, Ikea bookstore, a book club, and transforms them into these creepy novels that, again, we can all relate to and touch on these little parts of all of our lives that we may not realize there's fear lying just underneath the surface. Uh, In this discussion, again, we talk about his interest in folklore. We get into his early life growing up in England and then sort of how he became the horror person, basically, how he, you know, did a ton of reading to write paperbacks from hell. And uh, then it sort of transitions into a book recommendation episode at the very end. You can check out the show notes for all of the books that we both recommend. And I'm going to give you another book recommendation right now. And in keeping with the theme, we talk a little bit about Shirley Jackson in this episode. And it reminded me of Shirley Jackson's collection of short stories, Life Among the Savages. These are kind of lightly, moderately fictionalized memoiric stories where Shirley Jackson talks about the different things that she was doing as a mother and as a partner, uh, while also being, you know, perhaps one of the greatest horror novelists of all time. It's very, very funny. I think that's my my favorite thing about Life Among the Savages and its sequel, Raising Demons, is Shirley Jackson is known for being extremely creepy. And in these two books, she's very, very funny and very domestic, and it's just a joy to read. So, That is a book recommendation that is not so creepy. All the recommendations of the books that Grady and I talk about are going to be fairly creepy. Uh, If you are new here, and I know I got a a decent chunk of new listeners over the past week or so, I have an email address, passionsandprologues at gmail.com. You can always email me your passions, the things that you're passionate about whenever you like. And then every single month, I'm going to give away a bookshop.org a gift certificate to somebody at random. And also, if you leave me a rating or review, wherever you listen to podcasts, just send me a screenshot of that, again, at passionsandprologues at gmail.com, and I'll give you some customized book recommendations. And then you can always find me on Instagram and TikTok, the same name, Passions and Prologues. Okay, that's all of the housekeeping. I'm not going to keep you any longer. I am so excited to say that I hope you enjoy this discussion with Grady Hendrix on Passions and Prologues. Hi there, I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor, so while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardknowpodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. All right. So, Grady, I am extremely, extremely excited to ask you this first question. What is the thing you're super passionate about that we're going to discuss today? So one of my obsessions for many, many years is folk horror. And um, I I have a terrible voice. So F-O-L-K horror. Um, And it's it's something that is just... 
I'm always really jealous. When I was a kid, my dad worked in England for a couple of years. And so we lived over there for, for about a year and a half around there. I was uh, uh, six and seven. And it really got in my blood. And I, I sort of am obsessed with England. And it's, it's, it's that early childhood memory kind of place. And I read this book very early on when we were in the house we rented, the owner's left behind called um, Le- Legends, Folklore, and Superstitions of the British Isles and um, of Great Britain. And it was intense. It was heavily illustrated. It turns out it's a Reader's Digest book, but black fake leather cover, gold mask embossed on the front. And it was just amazing. And it gave me a taste for this. And one of the things that always bums me out because I'm an American, I write in America, I write about America. And um, we don't have that folk horror tradition. I mean, England's oozing with it. You know, they've got thousands of years of history to draw on and, and stone circles and druids and all this stuff and ancient forests. And, and, you know, in the States, We don't have that tradition. I mean, really, there's Stephen King's Children of the Corn, which has inspired 16 sequels, I think. (laughs) And there's Thomas Tryon's um, Harvest Home, which Mm -hmm. was a big bestseller in the 70s, but is largely forgotten today. And I guess if you go back further, there's Nathaniel Hawthorne's Young Goodman Brown. But we just don't have the tradition the way the UK does, this sort of in the fields, the f- in the furrows, this this idea of this landscape that's older than us, that mm-hmm. that reaches out and, and shapes us. And, and I think one of the problems is when you start looking too much at American history, you know, you, you wind up coming face to face with our two great original sins. I mean, you get into um, slavery, which is, you Mm -hmm. know, enslaved workers are the people who shaped the landscape, you know, not just in the South, but in the North, you know, these people built uh, earthworks and fields and agriculture and reshaped waterways and did all and and leveled forests. But, you know, you're already putting a foot into a really fraught, really even still contested to this day, part of American history. And then you go back further than that and you have the genocide against the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. So once you start, you know, in England, you start talking about folk horror and you can wade way out into where the the, the deep things swim. In the States, you start wading out and knee deep, you look down and you're just in blood and it just gets bloodier. And I think that's one reason we don't have a tradition we've embraced. I I love this answer so much. The second that you started talking about this, that three different like authors slash books came to mind. One is there is this young adult horror novel. Uh, it's an Irish horror novel called The Call by Potter O'Gean. Uh-huh. And it is brutal. I I even I hesitate to even call it young adult horror because it's just like it. Like it's one of those books where no one is safe. Like you think you meet a main character and they are just off right away. But the this, the basis for that novel is fairies and like quite clearly fictional characters, like you said, that have been steeped in Irish heritage. And then I think of from an American standpoint, you're absolutely right. Like I think of Ring Shout by P.J. Clark. Oh, yeah. And then yeah, yeah. everything like Stephen Graham Jones has done. Like you're right. Everything that is American, quote unquote, like full core is like you said, it's it's steeped in real life tragedy and pain and things that right. they're a to be frank like there's only so many people who can write about those things and should write about them and also right I, like you said it's also a little bit of like having a shorter documented history for us yeah so for well, you like, and also what, go ahead yeah. yeah and i was just gonna say really quickly and also the other thing is um they're still live, live issues today. I mean, you know, you can't talk about the genocide against Native Americans without talking about reservations and all the issues those bring up and, and blood quantums and all those things. And you can't talk about slavery without talking about black history and black culture today. So they're, they're so electrified, you know, still. Anyway, sorry, what were you about to say? No, no, it's okay. So I was, <clears throat> I was going to ask, like, you mentioned reading this, this first book and uh, I was joking with you before we started recording, like I have always had, uh, I won't get into spoilers for how to, how to sell a haunted house, which we'll talk about in just a little bit here, but like you introduced something very early on that creeped me out as a kid. And I've always had like a interesting fascination with, but you know, what was it about like that first book that made you want to keep exploring like folk horror and kind of how did it um, stay connected with you in, in your younger years? That's probably a little bit more obvious for people who are familiar with your work, how it stayed with you 
as an, as sure. an author, but in those early years, as those formative years, how do they connect with what you're doing? Sure. Well, there was sort of this thing where in my um, elementary school where I went to, because I was in, for, I just graduated from first grade when we moved to England. Um, we were on uh, the edge of a swamp. And so we would always play out in the swamp. And, you know, you'd sort of sneak past the supervisors and get into the trees and the swamp and the bushes. So that was always been really big in my imagination because as little kids, we turned it in this fantasy land with forts and wars and passages. And, you know, we had that mapped out. It was our world. And so already being in the woods and in this sort of like marshland was, was a big part, a big thing for me. And then in England, I was trying to get a handle on this country, not in any conscious way, but, you know, my parents were very much like, we're going to do something cultural every weekend. So they'd load us up into our Volkswagen van and drive to some pile of stones house, you know, mm -hmm. some great pile in the country or, you know, some grand house or to, to a Stonehenge or some Stonehenge Jr. or something like that and or a forest. And they were pretty boring. Mm -hmm. And so this book gave me something to project onto them that made them more exciting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, oh, this house actually had, you know, hiding hole, priest holes where priests would be hidden, Catholic priests would be hidden during the Elizabethan era and priest hunters would come looking for them and drag them out and torture them to death. And, you know, oh, this standing stone was where Druids sacrificed children. This forest was, you know, so large that no one ever went into the middle of it. And it was where a god walked or reportedly walked and a woman went missing. So being able to project that onto those things made them less boring and more exciting. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back to the States, um, back to the school with the swamp. But I also, I was, a, I was a Cub Scout and then a Boy Scout. And I never was very good at merit badges. Mostly what I was there for was the camping uh, and the hiking. And so I would spend a lot of time out in the woods on these campouts and it was so much fun. Um, and we would play these enormous games of capture the flag and, and tag in the woods in the dark in the middle of the night. And it was great. And it was just this fun sense of being in the middle of something away from people that had no regard for people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a forest feels like an individual. Mm -hmm. A forest never feels like here's a tree, here's a tree, here's a tree, here's a tree, here's a rock. A forest always feels like an organism to me. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's a far, it surrounds you and engulfs you. And so I think those three sort of experiences early in life really really made me primed for like things like the wicker man mm -hmm. did, so did you find those scenarios like exciting like were, were you the type of person who liked being scared as a kid because like i i feel like i have always had this interesting connection with horror where i love reading horror and i like watching some sorts of horror but like i feel like it was thrust upon me because i had friends who were obsessed with like the friday the 13th movies and anytime there would be you know, one of those like old, I don't know if it's like TBS or AMC, sure. they, they would have those, you know, they would watch, they would play like eight of them in a row and we would stay up all night watching them. And like, I feel like it was just because my friends liked them. I enjoyed them. So like now it's almost like a, a weird comfort to be uncomfortable for me, yeah. like for you in those moments in, in the woods and these different aspects, like, do you always find joy in that being scared aspect? Absolutely. Of it? I mean, it's scary, but it's mm -hmm. fun. And it's, um, it was always in the context of having fun. And I think I came to horror the way a lot of people do, which is my friends and I would rent a bunch of horror movies and then have a sleepover. And mm -hmm. between the movies, we'd go out and play like, you know, tag and stuff like that in the neighborhood in the dark. And uh, it was really fun. So to me, the associations growing up with horror, because I wasn't a huge horror guy. I mean, I read King, Clive Barker, but I wasn't like, oh my God, I love horror. I mostly felt too creepy, you know, the book covers. Mm -hmm. But my associations were were fun. They were friendly. They were, this was how we related to each other. So to me, horrors always felt like, carry those connotations of community and, and friendship. So at what point for you did it kind of switch? Because like you, again, for people who are familiar with your work, like you're not just a person who writes horror, like you wrote paperbacks from hell. Like you have this, like you are like one of the, what I would consider like the historians of horror. Like, oh, you, thank you. You're, yeah, you're one of the, yeah, you can put that on your website if you want. Like, yeah. I feel like <laughs> you're one of the people who now knows like this rich history 
of this genre. So like, when did it kind of switch for you from being like, oh, I enjoy, like you said, the, these movies and some King and aspects of that to like it being something that has it really become a massive part of, of your life? So I went, I was a, a journalist and, um, and when those jobs all ended in 2008, I sort of was like, what's my skill set here? It's typing. And mm-hmm. so I, cause I was, I did cultural coverage. So I wasn't like covering politics. I was covering stuff that was very replaceable by a staff writer. And so I went to Clarion's fantasy and science fiction workshop in 2009. And when I came out of there, I mean, I was writing everything. I was writing fantasy and science fiction and all kinds of stuff, but the stuff there I seen to be doing, to be writing stuff that people wanted to read was, was horror. And so I just leaned into that. Um, and of course I needed to know more about it. So I was reading as much as I could. And there were, you know, I'd read by then Shirley Jackson and, and all these people, but I was just reading more. And one of the things that happened to me is I felt like, well, this is a field that I need to know about. This is where I work. Mm-hmm. I gotta know what's going on. Um, you know, it's funny, Alan Moore always said that, uh, he really feels like he wants to know how the engine works in terms of writing. He really, and so I was like, yeah, why should I, why should this stuff be a mystery? So I was going to all these paperback swap shops and noticing they had these big horror sections with writers I'd never heard of. So I was reading them relatively randomly and writing about them for tour for about 25 bucks a pop, because if I did four of those in a month, that was like, that was, that was, that was, that was a nice little bit of income. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then my editor at Quirk, Jason Rakulik, was said, have you ever thought about pitching us a book of these things? And I was like, sure. And they bought it. Um, and then I had to sort of like, okay, there's got to be a story here. Yeah. You can't just throw this at people randomly. There's got to be a beginning, middle, and end. And I got Will Erickson, who runs the Too Much Horror Fiction blog, to write paperbacks from hell with me because he's the only person I could find who knew this stuff. I mean, better than I did. And we really figured out the history of it and um, of that era, the, you know, coming out of the 60s and the 70s, 80s, and then going away in the 90s for that boom. So yeah, so that was sort of the, the, the multi-pronged injection mm-hmm. I, I took into my brain. <laughs> no, that makes sense. And, and for you then, what, what draws you to a horror novel? Is it still like that, that folk aspect of it? Or are, are there different things? Because I feel like uh, there's a, a blurb for your latest book where they, they basically say like this, like I'm paraphrasing, but it's like this classic Grady Hendrix thing of like heartbreak and horror where it's like you you put emotion into the stories. And, that, and I agree, like I feel like every single one of your books, whether it's like We Sold Our Souls or Southern you know Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, like I feel like there's an aspect where I can connect with the characters. It's not just like, oh, I'm reading this because there's a killer on the loose and it's right. You'd be like, what is it? that draws you to reading a horror novel now? Well, it's funny. That's something I learned. I mean, I'll read anything. Do you know what I mean? I'll read, I'll read the dankest zebra skeleton doctor on the cover, 460 page padded out piece of garbage to, you know, Gabino Iglesias, new book. Like I'll read it all. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a really fast reader. So what I realized is that, and I learned this doing paperbacks from hell because I read something like 326 books in that 10 month period of these paperbacks to sort of get the context I needed to, to write the book. And what I realized was that there was an arms race going on. And if you were writing, okay, in chapter one, Bigfoot rips off this person's head. Okay. In chapter two, he rips off the head with the spine attached and beats him someone to death with okay well now we got to get into bigfoot having sex with so you just have to keep escalating these yeah. these spectacles and it was really oh a road it really led to a cul-de-sac where you're just you're just numb to it mm-hmm. but i i realized that if you can get readers super invested in the characters emotionally i mean then you didn't have to kill anyone because as long as it was important or scary or extreme or excruciating for the characters than it would be for the reader. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a, a needle prick in the right place is, you know, getting, if I, if I ever had a needle shoved under my fingernail, I mean, I'd be yeah. traumatized for years. Um, and so, you know, let alone had my head ripped off and my spine attached and be beaten to death with it. So, um, I, so I just realized that that was the way to make it work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's um, why, uh, like the Babadook was such a good, 
movie that people connect with is that kind of that exact reason like you cared about the characters and like you didn't even see the monster until you know it's like yeah. eight minutes into the movie i mean i just saw megan that killer doll movie and mm. she kills one two three people yeah in that movie and it's a very low body count but it works because you know it's about this kid and grief and parenting and all these other things mm-hmm. yeah and then, and then there is like the complete opposite side of that which is and i don't know if you read max brooks's uh devolution which is a yeah. big foot novel like and again i don't want to give anything away but like it becomes pretty clear like in like the middle of the book you're like something absurd has to happen for them to get out of it's like painting people into a corner and seeing yeah. how you can get them out of it <laughs> Well, and also the other thing is, listen, I love spectacle. You know what I mean? I really liked World War Z a lot, the, the, the book and the movie. I'm a zombie guy, so I'll, I'll ingest any zombie movie. Um, I love Tokyo Gore Police and Dead Alive or Brain Dead, as it's called. You know, Peter Jackson. So I love that stuff. But mm-hmm. spectacle has it, it's not a book thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, books are interior. And so if you're going to deploy spectacle, you've got to do it really judiciously mm-hmm. in a book. Yeah. So speaking of interiors with your new book, How to Sell a Haunted House, Haunted House stories, you know, you mentioned Shirley Jackson, like they are a thing that A, has been done and done and done, but they also are a, like they're a, they're a genre unto themselves. Like I have, I have a friend who you may be familiar with, Mallory O'Meara. She's a, mm-hmm. another podcaster. She has a reading glasses. She and I have been buddies for a long time now. And like, she's actually, she's my horror buddy who like, if I find a horror book that I've read that she hasn't yet, I feel like I've like won a prize getting to tell her about <laughs> it. But like she, she loves a horror book that is a haunted house. And so taking on the task of writing a haunted house book, like how did you approach that in a way that you're like, okay, I want to do something that hasn't been done before because it is a, a genre that is so wildly popular, but it, it is one that has been done so often. Yeah. So one of my big touchstones for this was Ann River Siddons, The House Next Door, mm-hmm. uh, which was a horror novel from the early 80s, but it's about a modern house. And, um, and, and it's really set in a recognizable contemporary world. And I really wanted to do that, you know, I, and, and I, I wanted to write a book about the relationship we have with inanimate objects, because, you know, when someone dies, you deal with the stuff they leave behind, right? It's their junk, it's their shoes, it's their clothes, it's their dolls, it's furniture, but also stories and memories and ghosts. And, um, and I was thinking about the relationship we have with inanimate objects. And, um, you know, like, yes, dolls are scary, but we all grew up with stuffed animals that we loved. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I realized is, you know, Oftentimes, if you look at Richard Matheson's Hell House or Shirley Jackson's Haunting of Hill House or even the house next door, houses are haunted by evil forces, you know, the Amityville Horror and the Entity or, you know, and it's like well, mostly what would haunt your house would be things you know, people who you know who died there. Like if a ghost haunts your house, it's probably someone who lived there or that lived there with you. Or if it's dolls, it's dolls you have and know. And so that's what I really want to do is make a house that was haunted, not by some like baseless dark force, Mm -hmm. but was haunted by basically, you know, the ghost of your parents. I mean, there was a very, very early version of this book where uh, the house was haunted by ghosts of the parents, Mm -hmm. but that got the slapstick so fast. I mean, you know, like that (laughs) immediately you're like, you know, the ghost of my mom's in the bathroom and I'm taking a shower. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, and that's, fun but it's not it's not emotionally resonant yeah, your mom like, sees your butt yeah it's like writing your own version of like beetlejuice and you're like okay how do i yeah. make this how do i make this work yeah so i want to i i always struggle when i'm interviewing horror novelists to be the person who talks about the book so i'll let you kind of like maybe beyond the fact that it is a haunted house book i'll let you talk a little bit about it that way you can say exactly how much you want to to talk because there are some parts relatively early in the book where it's like oh i think i see where this is going so for people who are unfamiliar with how to sell a haunted house do you want to kind of talk about it just a little sure. bit so and can know about it sure i mean i feel like what you need to know is that it's about uh two adult siblings mark and louise who hate each other and don't want to come anywhere near each other and they have to they wind up having to be in the same place at the same time and coexisting when their parents die unexpectedly and they go home and have to clean out their childhood home and put it on the market and Mm -hmm. it's haunted of course and it's haunted by killer puppets and dolls Mm -hmm. um and that i feel like once you know that you're like okay my haunted puppet and doll tolerance level is here and i don't want this book in my life Mm -hmm. and i'm curious for you from from an idea generating standpoint i 
I never, never ask authors, where do your ideas come from? Because I hate that. I feel like that's the thing you'll get on a radio show. But I think about your types of novels, like, you know, Horror Store and like We Sold Our Souls, where maybe, and even like Southern Book Club, like these are ideas that on their surface, like rock and roll music, an Ikea type store, they're not inherently creepy, but then there's things like, Final Girl Support Group, where obviously it's like, you know, slasher films and things people are very familiar with, exorcisms, and then Honda House, How to Sell Haunted House. Like, do you, are you always looking at ideas as a way as like, how can I turn this into a story? Or do you have something that kind of like catches you and sort of sits in your heart and like, oh, I, I need to tell a story about this place or in this location type of a thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing for me is um, it's really, really hard to look at the world. Um, like we see it so mediated, you know, we're seeing it through social media, we're seeing it through TV or movies or books. Um, and it's really hard to look at it, but I feel like my job is to sort of do that and look for the things that we all have in common and, and know, and then figure out a way to add something to that, that does something with it. So, you know, with, with horror store about a haunted Ikea, it's, you know, everyone knows Ikea, but at the same, everyone knows haunted houses, but at the same time, everyone's had a crappy job. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of us have worked retail. We all know how bad that is. So, okay, how do I make that come, come to life? Um, with, with how to sell a haunted house, it's, you know, we all had these childhood stuffed animals for the most part, and we did have these emotional connections with them. And we're all going to have to, at some point, clean out our parents' house when they die and, mm-hmm. and deal with the stuff they leave behind, uh, both, both, physical and, and, and metaphysical, you know? And so it's looking for those things, looking for those common points um, that, that sort of are out there, but they're so ordinary and every day, we don't really think of them. Um, you know, one thing I really wanted to do that I wasn't able to, when my editor didn't go for it, is um, during the pandemic, I really wanted to write something set in a hospital because I felt like we were all so obsessed with hospitals and mm-hmm. healthcare and all these things. And I really wanted to do something set in a hospital. And, and they were just like, that's more of a thriller. You write horror for us. You will get back in your cage. Um, so, uh, but, but I do feel like there are things like that out there that, that we know. Mm-hmm. And it's just keeping your eyes open for them, which is hard. Yeah, I feel like... Uh... I feel like there are people out there who would disagree with you. I feel like Chuck Wendig would would say, like, I think we can write about a pandemic in a, a creepy way. But yeah. Um, oh, and I definitely think you can. I just that was not what my editors wanted mm-hmm. for me at that moment. And one thing I learned early in my career is um, you and it sounds stupid, but it's you'd be amazed at how many people don't do it and how hard the lesson it was for me to learn. You never want to write a book that your publisher doesn't want to publish. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Um, and it sounds like to me what, what you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're always seeking a connection point in your story that people will be able to latch on to and say, this is an aspect that I understand, even if the rest of the like craziness around that is something that perhaps they can't, like if they can feel yeah. a connection to an aspect of your story. Does that sound right? Well, that's because I'm lazy, right? If I can connect to something that like you, that already resonates for someone, then I just, you know, that wheel's already spinning. I just need to keep giving a little taps along the side to keep it moving. I don't have to start it from zero. Mm-hmm. Do you find yourself now as an author still itching for, like, do you itch to write folklore like set in a different country or do you like find yourself wanting to tell stories that harken back to the things that you first discovered about this genre oh yeah i mean it's um i would love to write american folk horror and it's hard because so many of the archetypes are british and so it's really hard to find what's american and but, you know, we're a nation of immigrants. Uh, you know, we, we bring our folklore with us. So that's the way in. And I also think, you know, there's a difference between environmental horror and folk horror, right? Yes. Um, but at the same time, right now, there are two things that obsess everyone. And one is, one is sort of like income inequality, right? We talk about it all the time. It's, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, And the other one is global warming. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it is the number one issue out there. And it's 
the, the, the landscape. We are obsessed with landscape and the world, the natural world around us. And what have we done to it? And can we come back from it? Or is it too late? Um, we imagine what the world will look like emptied of us. We imagine whether the world's trying to kill us. Um, you know, these are all folk horror concerns. So I feel like there's really something there. Tying it together is going to be, all right, I don't have that missing piece yet. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean, because there, there is this, like, I feel like horror is a way that authors can offer up social commentary in a way that is almost like, I don't want to say safe, but it's like, it's, it disarms people. Like they get into the book because it's a Grady Hendrix book or like at its surface, it's about, you know, how to sell a haunted house. Like you said, like then you can talk about these environmental aspects. And and I do think horror is uniquely qualified for something like that. Listen, metaphors exist for a reason. It helps keep something at arm's length so you can look at it rather than letting it get too close so you look away. But also to me, it's like what I was saying about the wheel spinning. I'm not doing this so much to make a social comment as I am to like, I want to find things that people already care about and are already engaged with because then I I don't have to do the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I normally ask authors for just like any random recommendation they want to offer. It could be like, Talking about Mallory, she she talked about a protein powder that she liked because her episode about that with me was talking about powerlifting. But I can't have Grady Hendrix on my podcast and not ask you for some horror recommendations. So I'm asking oh, yeah. this off the top of your head, but what are some horror novels that you've read? It could be recently, it could be last year, whenever that that you think people should know about. Well, I'm going to recommend old ones. Yeah. Um, there you can find them; they're easy to find. But um, I would say almost anything by Michael McDowell. He was a um, a, a queer writer who um, died of AIDS in the 80s. But when he was alive, he was maybe the greatest paperback original writer mm-hmm. in the States. And his books are really fantastic. They're set in the South. The Elementals is amazing. Um, he wrote. He's most famous for writing the screenplay for Beetlejuice and Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. But his novels are phenomenal. So if you try the Elementals and like it, the best place to go after that is Cold Moon Over Babylon or his series, The Blackwater Saga. Um, Elizabeth Engstrom's When Darkness Loves Us is an incredible. It's two novellas published as a novel. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is really intense and very dark. And I would be really remiss if I didn't recommend, uh, speaking of folk horror, Barry Wood's uh, The Tribe, which is probably the great Jewish horror novel ever mm-hmm. written. Yeah, I love that. Speaking of, there's a book I've talked about a couple of times. I wouldn't classify it specifically as horror, but it's relative, or it's just relatively new. You mentioned Jewish horror. It's called Thistlefoot. It is. Oh, I don't uh, know it. Okay, so Thistlefoot, and sorry for everyone who is listening in that's heard me mention this book like 19 times, but I am obsessed with it. It is about. It's by Jenna Rose Nethercroft, Nethercott. And it is, um, it's based in the Jewish folklore of like Baba Yaga. And it's the story of these two siblings who are descendants of, of Baba Yaga. And they get, they inherit this house that sits on giant chicken legs and is like mobile. It's an actual like sentient house that they live in and they do no, really cool. country. Yeah. Speaking of puppets, they, they do a puppet show like that they travel around doing, but they're also being chased by this like dark secret thing. And it is just, it is one of the weirdest, strangest novels. But I, I do think you mentioned, you know, like Jewish folklore. Yeah. This is one that I think that you that would sounds awesome. Like. Yeah. Um, one last question for you. Is there a modern horror novel that's like, that you've read in the last couple of years that has just stuck with you that is like the oh, yeah. quintessential? Yeah. There's two that have really stuck with me. Paul Tremblay's Survivor Song, which is about an airborne coronavirus outbreak, which came out during, but he wrote it before the coronavirus. Outbreak. Really, it has a great surgery scene in it. And Stephen Graham Jones's The Only Good Indians um, are both books that really punch above their weight and stuck with me for a long time. Yeah, I fully agree about it. The only good Indians. It is fantastic. Uh, I feel like I could keep you here and talk about horror novels all day long, but I won't do that. I will be respectful. Grady, thank you so much for joining me today. No, dude, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. 
It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other Evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell. 